Hi, welcome to That's Classic. If you are interested in seeing some fantastic additional footage from my interviews, as well as receiving my newsletter, uh, please go to patreon.com slash that's classic. That's patreon.com slash that's classic. Enjoy. Well, today on That's Classic, as I often say, we have a great one, but we really do. We have a terrific one. Uh, today, we have none other than Clint Howard, who, I mean, I could I could say Clint was in this, Clint was in that, but he's been in so many, so many projects. And of course, he was, you know, on the Andy Griffith show. He was, you know, he started in Gentle Ben, uh, just so many things. But uh, Clint, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure, John. Cool. I mean, listen, it, it is it is a it is a career to certainly kind of take a look at and go, wow. Yeah, it is. It really is. I have to say, um, I was blown away. I looked through all your credits. I looked through everything. I was like, my gosh, I knew he was in a lot, but you were in a lot more than I even realized. But um, I wanted to, let's start off. I'll tell you what, why don't we start off first? I was always curious about this. In everything that I've read, every interview I've ever seen, you and Ron have always been very supportive of one another. And I'm just curious, did you ever feel competition with Ron at any stage in the game? Oh, no, not at all. I mean, listen, the dynamics of our family. Mom and dad just did this spectacular job of of of, of you know, navigating us through the business when we were children. But oh, yeah. just but but forget the business just mm -hmm. as an older brother. First of all, we're five years apart. So if you just kind of, you know, take a step back. I was five. He was 10. Yeah. You know, there was never an opportunity where I felt like I physically could compete with him, you know, because he'd kick my ass. I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't until I got into my early 20s that I figured I could probably go ahead and turn around and kick his ass. But, that was, <laughs> but the cloth was cut long before that with love and nurturing. And, and you know, I, I say this and I will say this for as long as I have a voice. Ron is a Hall of Fame movie director. Oh, let, of course. Let me tell you one thing. He's a better big brother than he is a Hall of Fame movie director. So, you know, wow. and, and that I'm speaking, I'm speaking the truth from the bottom of my heart. He's just a he's a great dude, mm -hmm. you know, and and boy, you know, he, he and he happens to be my brother. <laughs> right, right. Do you ever, by the way, when when he is directing you, because of course you've been in like every, I believe it was 16 films. Am I getting that right? Somewhere in there? Yeah. But listen, yeah. we could do we could do a long, we could do a long segment of this show on all the films that he did. No, I got you. But when he's what I what I was gonna say is when he is directing you and you're getting into a role, because you're kind of a chameleon to me when I watch you, you can just go in there. Does he direct you in any other way that the two of you kind of have your own, you know, your own way versus when he's directing, you know, the other actors? Well, I think the big advantage for me, and I think the big advantage for the, you know, when I do have an opportunity to work on one of his projects is that we do, we have great communication, you know, and we certainly in each and every, you know, incident or, you know, time that we've worked together, um, we've talked about, you know, what he expects and, and kind of the character. And he always is very open for collaboration. He always loves to have other ideas. It's not just me. It's all of his actors that, that work for him. Mm -hmm. they're, they're certainly allowed to bring what they have to the table. And so, you know, it, it's our communication that we talk about it. You know, I can tell when I pitch an idea about a, a, what kind of character I'm, I would, I'd like to make this guy, what kind of voice I might want to use, mm -hmm. you know, whatever that the case may be. Yeah, I can tell by the tone of his voice and the look in his eye if he's responding to it, you know, and yeah. and and listen, long ago. I think Ron realized he can really trust me with a character, with a mm -hmm. responsibility of doing a job. I mean, I have a couple of specific incidences that happened, you know, when I was in my 20s, where I stepped up to the table and I delivered for him. Mm. And, and, you know, he was very appreciative of the situation. I'll give one example. Sure, about please. Is that 
I had an opportunity, and I believe it was about 1980, oh, I don't know, 89 or 88, mm -hmm. uh, that he made Backdraft. He did yeah. the movie. He did the movie Backdraft, and at, at that point, I had worked on all of his films, and it was, you know, I mean, I really had from from even his student films to his first directing thing, Grand Theft Auto, and onward. I, there was always a nice role for me, and then this Backdraft came along, and and yeah, I could have played a firefighter maybe, and 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 yet Ron didn't really see me in that position. But there was an autopsy technician who has a scene with Robert De Niro. Wow. And and I, at that point, I mean, you know, De Niro had done all his massive were Raging Bull, and he had been a Godfather Part Two. I mean, yeah, I mean, come on, talk about a Hall of Famer. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, I'm just you know drooling at the opportunity to work with De Niro and very excited. And Ron, you know, sort of says, "Listen, we we you know we need to have you be strong and need to have you be solid and be prepared and step up." And that day of filming with working with Bob on Backdraft is probably the greatest day of my acting career. Wow. Um, it was just, you know, Ron gave me, it's another wonderful advantage I have because I have such communication with the director. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron was able to give me a little scouting report about the way Bob operated, the way he worked, what his process was. And I wow. was fully prepared. You know, Bob starts out, Bob starts out, you know, slow slow he's very deliberate in his acting it's the first few takes aren't ones going to be able to look to use and you know and ron warned me of this gave wow. me a scouting report he, listen you get you be just be be advised that we're going to do a lot of takes and bob likes to warm up and i'll tell you you wow. know a couple of takes went by and then it started to get good and it was cooking, you know, we did the master shot and probably a master from two different directions. And, and, and all of a sudden it was just like, you know, butter. It was just beautiful. Wow. And, and now here's a, here's a side story. Please, please. That, that, that I'll tell on myself a little bit. You know, I've been known to put my foot in my mouth from time to time in my life. Like, Quince, come on, come on. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we we started working together you know me and bob and billy baldwin was was plant was up in the scene and it was going great and i was feeling very confident and yeah. it must have been about oh 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and and you know starting at 7 7 30 in the morning and you know and i'm a young actor and i'm working with robert de niro i'm feeling really good right and, and i'm standing next to ron and they're in between setups and the craft service woman, the, the the woman whose job it is, is to feed the crew outside of lunch, you know, right, and they, make, right. they, make, they make goodies and there's usually a craft, there is a craft service table, but then on a lot of shows, that craft service person will bring food to the set, yeah. like hors d'oeuvres, finger food, whatever it might be. Quick, quick so, bite. Yeah. So, so this, so, so this woman was bringing around a tray. And I'm standing next to Ron feeling really confident, really confident. And and uh, she brings by this tray and I look down and it's broccoli pizza. <laughs> and and I and I'm I go, <laughs> my God, who in the hell would order effing broccoli pizza? <laughs> Ron leaned into me and said, you know, it's Bob's favorite pizza. <laughs> favorite and 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 bob was about eight feet away from me behind <laughs> me so i couldn't see it but i was feeling so confident in that moment because i'd been acting with robert de niro that i who in the <laughs> hell would order this bringing pizza and i had to uh, the, 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 the food was coming out of my mouth for a couple of minutes bob didn't, oh. he obviously heard me but it <laughs> that's funny as hell Oh man. So anyway, that's a, that's an, that is an all timer for me of putting my foot in my mouth. I but love it. I it love was it. A, it was a beautiful day of working and it was a great opportunity. And I'm forever grateful that, you know, my brother, you know, is, has been involved in some outstanding movies. I mean, oh, come on. Yeah. Apollo 13. I mean, people yeah. ask me all the time if I'm out at a convention or something or getting to talk to the public, they yeah. people ask me, you know, well, What's your favorite experience? And I would say that, and I do say that Apollo 13. And why is I, that? 
Well, I, I was a space geek. I, mm-hmm. I, I grew up, I grew up with a, uh, with a model of the Saturn V rocket in my bedroom. Wow. I can remember exactly where I was when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I was, yeah. you know, at that age, I think I was 12 or 13 years old, you know, right. so I, I maybe not 13, but I was aware of it and, and, and paid sure. attention to stuff. So then getting to circle back as an adult in 1994 and, and, and get to play a NASA flight controller. Wow. In a project that had so much integrity because yeah. led by Ron and Tom Hanks and, and, and the entire production crew, everybody wanted to do NASA right. And, and oh, yeah. so the, the choices that were made were not melodramatic, you know, and I love, first of all, I personally love the movie. I mean, Oh, I, come I, on. It was a classic. It is a classic. Yeah. And getting, getting to work with Ed Harris. Ah, and, and having those experiences, being around all those actors that were flight controllers, it's the one experience. I've actually had two experiences in my life as an actor where the friendships I developed on the set uh-huh. were friendships that I carried forward in my life and still am friends. I mean, and, and with the guys, the the girl, they called them back then. I, there's a group of us that, that it's coined were the girls of mission control. <laughs> I think Chris Ellis coined the phrase. It was a group of us that hung out. We have these wonderful memories of, of bonding together because I think that was probably five or six weeks worth of work in wow. mission control. Um, it was just a, a great experience. And the other movie, completely a different tone of movie what was the wraith the wraith i i gotta be honest i didn't see it oh no the the wraith is a kind of a science fiction fantasy movie starring charlie sheen sherilyn finn nick cassavetes um really directed by a guy named mike marvin oh in a lot of circles it's the bomb in a lot of circles the Wraith. I'm writing it down yeah it, it, w-r-a-i-t-h and I played this character, this very entertaining character in the movie called Rughead. And I wore this eraser style. You remember eraser head? I do. I do. I wore I wore this eraser head style toupee. And uh, I was um, I was in this gang, this bad gang. Nick Cassavetes was the worst of the gang members. And there was wow. David Sherrill and Jamie Bozian and Chris Nash and... Uh, and, and Tatum O'Neill, not Tatum oh. O'Neill, um, um, Griffin O'Neill. Oh my gosh, what we a were cast. Part of this gang! And we were we were terrorizing Charlie Sheen's character. And as it turns out, Charlie Sheen is a is is a ghost from outer space, and and Charlie Sheen has come down to get retribution on his death. Wow. Wow. And anyway, and anyway, so finally, I mean, uh, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, <laughs> the wraith actually kills everybody except me. Cause I didn't, the, 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 in, in the film, I didn't really ever do anything wrong. And I was a harmless gang member and, and I might, I might've been creepy, but I was, I was decent. So the, right. so Charlie's character, the wraith, um, he he spared me and it, the movie also starred randy quaid oh my gosh come on yeah so anyway you should check it out i think i it will was, check it out i think it was 1986 and it's got a great soundtrack it's okay. got it is the soundtrack ozzy's in the on the soundtrack i can't recall it's heavy metal wow a lot of car a lot of car racing because the the wraith charlie sheen's character comes back to earth in a really exotic car, fat like a like a, like a car yeah. from outer space, basically, and he just sets out to just pretty much destroy us. What did you enjoy most about working on that? Tom Rodery. yeah, you know, got it. It, it was same with the, the mission control. Yeah, it was the time of my life. I was think I was twenty seven years old, and 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 I had done a lot of acting, and I hadn't had at that time I hadn't worked a lot in the last year or two. And I, and Mike Marvin contacted me about wanting to play this character Rughead, and it was a great group of guys. And we filmed for a month or a month and a half in Tucson, Arizona. Yeah. We were all Charlie. Uh, I, I've become long, long, lifelong friends with Charlie. Wow, very cool. He's a really cool dude, and he was really young. This is before Platoon. Oh wow, wow. And so so 
anyway, that's just and and like Dave yeah. Sherrill and Jamie Bozian and Chris Nash, there there's just um what would be the term you know uh, kind of a fraternity. Yeah, having I get you. Wraith, it was just and a silly little movie. It didn't perform all that well. However, it does hold up. Yeah. And and over time, it has developed this really, really loyal, you know, fan audience. Movie. Yeah. Which again, I mean, I work on my brother's movies, right? And I, Austin Powers, and 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 I worked for Adam Sandler a few times. Sure. In Waterboy and Little Nicky. The the uh, two of the nicest guys, by the way, in the business. You always hear that about Ron. You always hear that about Adam. By the way, it's true. Yeah. You know, the Mount Rushmore of nice guys in the business would be Ron, mm -hmm. Adam, and Henry Winkler. I knew you were going to say Henry. I was going to say it, but I knew it. Yeah, yeah. 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 I agree with you. Oh, yeah. no. Henry is, in fact, just just recently, uh, I hadn't done one in a long time. I, I went to the Hollywood Collectors Show. Yeah, you know, yeah. Opportunity where it's really a pop show it's it's mm -hmm. it's not just horror i uh, my wife cat and i end up usually going to oh you know a half a dozen horror conventions because oh I i'm just, sure yeah i find them fun with my horror titles people love me there in that genre and i appreciate it and it's a hoot and it's an opportunity for me to get out and and, yeah. and meet the fans and stuff but i went and did the hollywood collector show and i saw and henry did henry was there yeah and my goodness, I hadn't seen Henry in I don't know, probably ten years. You know, we oh wow, maybe less than that because I I saw him at Aaron Moran's um, when Aaron Moran passed away. I had an opportunity to see him on oh, the memorial or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, but man, he's getting Henry's in his well into his seventies now. You know, yep. and he is the gentlest, sweetest, sharpest dude. You know, he's not a pushover. But no, he, but he really approaches the business from a standpoint of love and goodness and thankfulness. You know, yeah. there is, I mean, listen, I, I hate to even mention friggin' Weinstein's name. But yeah. There are, the, there are the real ultimate a-holes. Right. And then there's, you know, Henry and Ron and yep. Adam who just bring genuine kind of goodness. I mean, I don't want to, now I'm starting to sound too No, fancy. I... I had Henry on the show and Henry was literally as kind, as sweet, thoughtful, thankful. I can't, you know, I could just throw him out all day. So great guy. Really yeah. just the best. No, no. I agree. So anyway, so, I mean, let's, yeah, they're, 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 those guys are great. And Adam, Adam, what a, what a hoot. What, first of all, I'm very, my first time I'd ever worked with it with Adam. Yeah. Was, was on Waterboy. Yep. And he already had hit. So Adam had become a big star. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, I, I hadn't. I don't think I had seen Happy Gilmore. I know I hadn't seen Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Um, I'd seen him a couple of times on, on Saturday Night Live for a few minutes. And I'd heard the, I heard that, you know, he's a big star. And I was expecting a kid that, you know, I don't know, might not be all there. Or there was a kid, he might have issues or something. Right, like, right. Maybe, and it is just so far from the opposite. I mean, God, you know, back then he was focused. Mm -hmm. he, he, he's funny, but he doesn't try to, he does the thing about Adam is you never feel like he's got to tell a joke. Mm -hmm. You never feel like that he's got this thing where he's got to be the funny guy. Mm -hmm. However, he's friggin' hilarious and he is a leader. You yeah. can there is a natural kinetic thing where people want to follow him. And, yeah. And, and, and he doesn't let that go to his head. Um, and it's, you know, you no, know, he's a really cool guy. And, I, and he's responsible for two of my most hilarious moments, uh, you know, as an actor working mm -hmm. in, in little Nikki, where I played the transvestite named nipples. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it just oh, came no. back to me. Oh no, nipples! I don't need luck. Um, <laughs> and it was that was all Adam. I didn't invent any of that. I mean, I help. I augment. I always augment stuff, but I don't invent these characters. And, oh, that's and, funny. I you know, I think he comes also. He comes from you know, you're you and uh, Ron obviously with with your father Rance. 
very like humble beginnings, very like, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, good work ethic and all that. He does too, by the way, his dad was an electrical engineer and he, he actually told Adam, if you don't make it by the time you're 24, don't worry, you got a job here. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's where it comes from. Well, you know, one thing about Adam, I mean, which, listen, I was not, I'm not a historian about this, but I just yeah. know it's accurate that, you know, he was not some overnight success. Right. He started doing comedy when he was a kid. He was going out and doing in, in the New York area. Yep. He was going and doing stand up when he was friggin' still a teenager. That's right. So, so, you know, when he hit, when, when Adam, he came along in, um, in, in Saturday Night Live and right. he, I know he had done a few comedy albums. Mm -hmm. He did Happy Gilmore, which everybody loved. I mean, it, people thought, oh, overnight success. No, no. no. He, he 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 earned his stripes, and and he also, you know, I didn't know anything about his family. I just mm -hmm. knew uh, it's obvious he obviously was raised right. Oh yeah, he, totally, totally. Let let me ask you, um, obviously, because people are going to go, hey, what the heck? Where's the Jeto Ben stuff? Where's the Andy Griffith stuff? So let's just get that that uh, in there just slightly. On Andy Griffith, by the way, obviously, I, I've watched the show many times, and and Leon, your character is a classic if I've ever seen one. But you were very young then. Um, did you do you have strong recollections of like Andy Griffith and Don Knotts during that time, or were you just too young? No, I have virtually no memory mm -hmm. of being two, three, four years old. Right, working on the Andy Griffith show. I j just don't. My memories, my my memory of my acting career kind of kick in when I'm six. Yeah, I, yeah, I hear you. Well, General so, Ben, come on. I yeah, mean, well, that, and yeah. that was a little later. That gentle Ben started when I was set late seven, eight, nine years old. That's were you I... ever? By the way, I was thinking of this, and I used to think this when I watched the show. By the way, I watched the show. Um, were you ever? Did you ever feel like you were ever in danger in Florida at all? Like you know, with with because you guys were in the Everglades, all that stuff. You know, uh, you got a big bear. Did you ever have? Was there ever a you know dangerous moment or dangerous sense or not? No, not at all. Listen, dad was there every step of the way and mm -hmm. I'm complete trust in dad and, and, uh, you know, show business, making a movie, doing a television show. It ain't friggin' danger city. I mean, it, they, they, we yeah. had, we had animal trainers. I had dad and they did a, a really smart thing when they, when they first introduced me to Bruno, Bruno was the main the, bear. Yeah. 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 Who played we had, ben. Yeah, we had three. We had three bears. We had Bruno, Buck, and Drum. And those were the bears that made up Gentle Ben. Um, that the the very first time they they introduced um, uh, me to Bruno. Well, mm -hmm. actually, it wasn't the first time. I actually had an opportunity to do a filmed audition with Bruno. I was a. It was uh, what do you call it? You know, a, a screen film. test. Screen test. Yeah. A screen test for the movie Gentle Giant. First, we made a movie called Gentle Giant, hmm. and and then that movie it was a good it's a good little movie. It has Dennis Weaver and Vera Miles are the two leads. Oh wow! Wow. Vera chose not to do the television series, but while while the movie was being made, Ivan Tors, the producer, went ahead and sold the idea to CBS to make a half hour adventure show that would hmm. dovetail. Um, Flipper, because oh, right, of course, yeah. I of course was had already been in production on Flipper, and that was a very successful show. Yeah. And then he sold the network the idea of doing this show about a boy and a bear in the Florida Everglades. And Dennis Weaver signed on, and they recast the the Vera Miles's role. She played my mother. Mm -hmm. They recast it with a woman named Beth Burkell. And so when, then we 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 did the movie, and then went basically. Eight weeks later, we started doing the television series. Was that just a wonderful experience for you as as a child? I mean, not only bonding with your dad, but I mean, by the way, for those that don't know, I mean, he not only acted in, but didn't he also write some of the shows? Yeah, I think dad wrote five or six episodes and then had a couple other story ideas that where he pitched the story idea and somebody else wrote it. I mean, yeah. dad was writing about as much as he could write. You got to remember back in those days, a writer sat at a manual typewriter right. and typed his pages. Right. 
and and had carbon paper. And if he misspelled something, he would have to go back with the little whiteout. And, oh yeah, and, right. Oh yeah. So anyway, I mean, for dad to write six episodes over the course of a couple of years, yeah. And dad was a good writer. Uh, he wrote some of the better Gentle Ben episodes, actually. Um, the the um, no, it was a great experience, and you know, bonding with dad, being around all the animals and the yeah. animal trainers, and and the whole. I still, I I have very very fond memories of you know the entire production team. There was a just a wonderful collection of both you know like New York type people and Florida type people that worked on Gentle Ben from from uh oh god i'm bob sherman rob sherman it was the i'm I'm brain locking on his on his first name he was the like the line producer of the show Mm -hmm. he was really andy white was a story guy that was always around rico browning gert oswald was one of the directors uh of course dad and dennis weaver and beth burkell um uh, did you stay close with dennis by the way well, you know, dad did. And I, I crossed yeah. paths with Dennis a couple of times in, in adulthood, but not as much as you might think, yeah. you know, I mean, but dad did listen. The, the, I mean, this is a story that's in the book that Ron they were, they knew each other boys. Yeah. Uh, Dennis Weaver introduced my mom and dad to each other at the university of Oklahoma. I mean, how bizarre is that? Seriously? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. 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 Well, he, he was an upper division he was an upper division theater major at OU yeah. and, and mom was a sophomore and dad was a freshman and Dennis was running a scene study class in the drama department. And, yeah. and literally it was about, you know, they were, they were having the scene study class and wow. Dennis Weaver had a scene for the, for his students to do. And he handed dad aside and he handed mom aside and he said, you guys go off and 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 learn this scene and you know listen I obviously wasn't there right right as, as the story was told and I believe it you know sparks flew and mom and dad had this torrid love affair that 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 sent them first to Nashville trying yep. to hunt down work in the theater and then to New York City and you know as as I wrote in in the boys I gave I I would have given dad no chance to make it in the business I mean, right shows you what i know he was such a hick yeah yeah and and it, they're take it, it doesn't it take a certain amount of sophistication and, and stuff to get into the business well it really doesn't how about yeah 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 no it takes a lot of chutzpah is what it takes and talent yeah yeah and you know here's the thing about dad and listen let us not discount mom i mean you know no, your your mother your mother yeah i i actually I want to ask something about that. Not that I want to discount your dad, by the way, but um, your mother, obviously she, she was an actress. Then she has you, you and your brother, and she's there for you guys, like really there for you guys. And then later on, I believe it's cocoon. She comes back into acting. What was that like for her? Like, like uh, to kind of connect back. What did did you, did you see a, a real change there? Oh, no, no change in mom. It was wonderful because it gave mom something to do. But did she light up at the opportunity to be back, so to speak? Well, she lit up at the opportunity to do something. Yeah. It was an empty nest situation. Mom had been stay at home mom back Mm -hmm. in those days in the 60s and the 70s. There was no interest, no desire. We needed mom needed to be at home. Yeah. You know, the mom wasn't going to work. My right. mom was working. She was working as mom. She as was, a full-time mom, yeah. She was PTA mom. She was little league mom. Yep. Uh, you know, dad was the one that was out grinding a career. So yeah. mom, uh, and then empty nest, you know, I take off. And 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 in this was about 1984. You know, I had been out of, I had been out of um, high school for, I don't know, four or five years, I guess. Right. My math might be a little fuzzy, but mom was really needing to do something. She was getting a little squirrely. Yeah. And she, she sold, she sold tours uh, at the ambassador hotel. She worked for a friend of hers, you know, with a gray line bus tour. Oh my tours. gosh. But then when given the opportunity to go down to Florida and be woman number 57 yep. in Ron's movie, the initial attraction that mom had to doing this 
was a curiosity to see whether she might enjoy being around a set and doing this as an actress. She didn't have much to do. She was basically a glorified extra. Yeah. That she might have had one or one or two lines in the movie that gave her kind of that in. But you see, uh, Jessica Tandy, mm-hmm. Wynne Verdon, there were these um, um, G- um, Maureen Stapleton. Right. The, these women that mom had grown up admiring. Right. They were working on the movie. So mom got to be around them. And yeah. the, one, the one thing that really spurred mom's second career forward was that those women really admired mom mm. for being a mom, mm. for not being distracted. And, and you know, I, the, she had long talks. Mom could have long talks with anybody. Mom yeah. was that mom could have long talks with somebody in an elevator going two floors up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know that type. You know, so, so, but it, no, the, those women gave her the confidence. First of all, they, they gave her a pat on the back for being a great mother. Right. Here she was the mother to the director and the mother to me. And then she had, you know, there was love and, and it was, it seemed to be all sorts of good health. Um, and, you know, I think, she told Ron this more than she told me this directly, but it was that 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 being around those women, those stars, um, that it gave mom the confidence that she had made the right decision and that she still, she was only in her early 50s. Right. She could have the opportunity to, if she so choose, which she did, to to go out and be an actress and she worked a lot you know and of course yeah. her, her famous moment is playing grandma lovell in apollo 13 that's right right yeah if jimmy could if they could get a washing machine to fly my jimmy could land it she had a couple of great she looked look, she was she looked right up at neil armstrong and said are you in the space program too <laughs> <laughs> So it's pretty cool. It's yeah. It is. One thing that mom, one thing that mom let in. Yeah, sure. To me. And this was all, th- all throughout our lives. I mean, yeah. not when I was a real little kid, but you know, she didn't like when she was an ingenue, she didn't like the business. Mm-hmm. She didn't like the competition. She mm-hmm. didn't like the fact that, you know, she would go into a room and there would be 30 ingenues there. That, that Right. Would, yeah. So when, when, after she had Ron and, you know, uh, and, and mom and dad were, you know, beginning their family, mom just made a decision that she would just be much happier with herself if she didn't pursue this competitive thing that is show business, especially for frigging actresses. God, mom, that, t- that took a lot. That's wonderful that she yeah, did. That. Yeah. I mean, and, on. and it was really, and I'll tell you what, this is, mom was, mom was extremely practical yeah the the thing that she was most proud of was the fact that she worked 10 consecutive years with screen actors guild under a screen actors guild contract and she worked enough to get her own pension and her own health plan oh god what what a dream as an actor it is yeah. it is that's big believe me i i have an acting background i i know what that means so believe me i get yeah. you so, and she um, did it, and you know, with, listen, Henry hired her a couple of times. Yeah. In fact, the first outs, once she got, once she did Cocoon, the first, I think the, the next kind of big job she got was Henry hired her in a Dolly Parton TV movie called Smoky Mountain Christmas. And oh she God. got, she got to do a scene with Dolly Parton, which. Oh, really, come on. It was awesome. You know, and, and wow. she has She's only in it for just a, a minute or two, but she's great in the beginning of Scrooged. Oh, I don't. Bill, I, I'll have to check that out again. I watch that every year. Lee Majors, Lee Majors. At the very beginning, they're showing clips of this wild, crazy TV movie that Bill Murray had told him to make, and it was yeah. it was the crazy Santa Claus, the invasion, and there are, somebody's attacking the North Pole. <laughs> and mom plays Mrs. Claus in that movie. <laughs> oh my so gosh. Next Christmas, you'll have to just pay attention. Mom's Mrs. Claus. I will t- pay attention. Okay. I, one other one that I was curious about, which I, I don't even know if you remember this or not, but do you remember working on Night Gallery? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Cause I got to be honest with you, Clint, when I was a kid, well, I, I say as a kid, but even as an adult, that show scared the living hell out of me. So I'm wondering, do what was that experience like? And did you get a chance to meet Rod Serling? Well, the answer to the second question is no. Okay. It, it, which, yeah. I had, which I had, and you know, he had, he, he, he wrote the words. It was yeah. based on somebody else. It was based on a book, I think, or based on a short story. Uh, and then Rod Serling took that and, and made it an episode of night gallery. And, uh, you know, I was 12 years old at the time and yeah. with all acting roles, no matter what the significance on the page is, it's just a job. Yeah. It's just a job. And, you know, yes, the words I spoke and, and, and the, the, the arc that my character went through was heavy. I mean, was it I creepy? The, I mean, I, is there a creepiness well, that was in that? No, no, I don't know. Listen, for me, at that point in my life, with with dad there being my friggin' guide, I mean, what an ultimate man, what an ultimate uh, oh, prize that I had. Is you have a rock I, right there, yeah. A rock, a warm rock right there that was just mm -hmm. you know always there to sort of comfort and guide. And but I'll tell you what, you know, those episodes, I think we probably filmed that in three or four days tops. Wow. And so I had a lot of dialogue. Yeah, I wasn't worried too much about frigging the, the overall scheme of the things. I was worried about each and every scene being able to produce those moments, you know, and, and the scene with the grandfather at the end where I tell him it's going to be a better, you know, listen, after tonight, it's things might be better, you know. Anyway, it is a creepy thing and it, it's not lost on me as an adult. Okay. My goodness, to get to, to, get to play a character that predicted the end of everything yeah and do it in an honest way and have that in my in 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 my catalog it's That's a big deal i i had an opportunity to i i know the cheap trick guys the band cheap trick yeah guys. sure sure and dax nielsen who is rick nielsen's son dax is now the drummer for the band oh, i didn't they, know that yeah when they tour sound and, great oh yeah yeah, yeah they, they still we just saw him we just saw him four or five months ago and oh, wow. it was as good as ever you know and, and but anyway the first time i met dax he was so excited and and he says you have an enormous catalog <laughs> and i've never i mean i i never heard i have a resume i, right. I you know i have a credits list but i, <laughs> all, but I have a but Dax, in coming out of the music business, he called it a catalog. So listen, it is not lost on me. Yeah, I know. I get it. I, role, I totally get it. Yeah. That role, you know, and, and listen, it's not lost on me that I was in Evil Speak, which is a movie about a kid that gets possessed by the devil and cuts off people's heads. Right, right. Do you, by the way, in the horror genre, do you have a, a part or two that you like kind of put up like that? Those are my favorites, like playing, because you've been in quite a few horror, actually. Yeah. I love it. I, I, you know, listen, I go back to, listen, it, some of them, they're, they're called B movies and there's a reason why they're called B movies. Sure, sure, sure. If you analyze them on a shot for shot basis, you see there's, you know, it's kind of Swiss cheesy. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but like, you know, I was proud of Evil Speak because it was really the first, was I, I was the lead of the movie. I was young and Eric Weston, the director and Irv Goodenough, the cinematographer, really drew me close and allowed it to be this sort of trilogy of creative people making decisions. And, and as we made that movie, I, I really felt like I was a creative part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a movie that I'm, that in a weird way, I was really proud of and it is a movie called ice cream man. Yeah. Which is, in 1993 or 1994, I got hired by a guy named Norman Epstein to be in this little cheesy horror movie with kids called Ice Cream Man. And we made it and it was fun. And it, you know, it did okay. It was, you know, basically one of those video rentals, you know? Yeah. And yet over the years, it is unbelievable to, to recognize, to have people come up and, and tell me how much this silly little movie Ice Cream Man meant to them. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's it's probably well by far and away, it's my most successful 
most well-known horror title. And in, fact, and in fact, Norman and I are, we are going to make another ice cream man. Oh my and gosh. Well, I know gonna, it has a cult following. I actually have heard the title. I haven't seen the movie, but yeah, uh, I, yeah. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Well, I'm, you know, I was in my, I was in my, what, you know, mid thirties when, when I played ice cream man and he's mm -hmm. just this psychotic nut. Right. And, and we're making another ice cream man. It's not a sequel. It's not a follow-up movie that, you know, it's just, we've invented a, we've invented a story with a plot and a backstory about an old ice cream man. Oh my and, God. That'll be wonderful. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah, we we actually were we're really right in the middle of the creative process. I mean, as we speak, I mean, I this morning I was reading a fresh first draft of the script. Norman and okay. I Okay, for for fans of that movie, they're going to be thrilled to hear that when they when they listen to this, you know. Um hey, I I got to ask you about something too before before we uh we go and I forget. Cuz obviously Star Trek, you have been such a part of that universe and uh you know, starting with uh uh Oh my God, I almost blanked out. Ba Balak. Ba 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 Balak. Yeah. Balak. Yeah. Balak. Um, first, the first thing is when you played Balak, because you were younger, do you have a recollection of that? Like in that, you know, like being in there with Shatner and Nimoy or whatever in the ship and all that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. In fact, that's right. That's where I was about six years old. Maybe I just turned seven. And I, th th that is a movie, that is a, 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 a job. Yeah. that I do have recollections of. I have vague recollections of working on an episode of Bonanza. And then and then I have recollections of working on, on Star Trek. Not completely. No, but little totally. bits, yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, there was, I had to wear a skull cap. And they asked me um, if I would, I would be willing to shave my head for the role and i that's and that was a non-starter for a guy kid seven years old in the third <laughs> yeah, grade. come on yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know paint myself into that corner and right. of course i mean they did say there there was an option which was putting a skull cap on me yeah so yeah. it was just another example of dad guiding me through developing a character understanding who i was and 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 what you know, what my role was in the episode and what my role was in terms of the other characters that I was dealing with. The Tranya, acting, I remember that. Yes, yes, Tranya, I hope you relish it as much as I. <laughs> now, ultimately, my voice was redubbed. There was an actor that came in and did my voice and did a re remarkable job. I mean, it, it just, yeah. my episode of Star Trek should remind everyone what a collaborative effort working in this medium is it yeah. ain't just it ain't just the dude with the pretty face mm -hmm. right it's it's wardrobe cost it's 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 makeup it's the writing yep it's the it's the directing it's the editing it's it's the sound it all come together but i you know i still learned all the dialogue and it was a mouthful of dialogue and i remember by that point i guess you know dad would had the patience and and we worked through oh. it and and just sort of beat by beat, I, I idea by idea, you know, he taught me, you know, kind of how to go about it. It wasn't memorizing. What a gift. It's not, it wasn't, it was never about memorizing. Wow. That's the, I mean, I, sometimes I catch myself as an actor just going, freaking, I gotta learn the lines. I gotta just memorize it. And that's, it's just a lazy way to go. But the really, the pure way to act is to really break it down and you learn the ideas because acting is really simple. Yeah. Everybody's got it. Everybody has motive. Everybody has intention for doing everything they ever do. There's always right. a reason. And so, you know, that was taught to me early by dad. And that is simple. Know where you know where you've been, know why you're entering a certain situation and and then know why where you're going. Wow. You know, where you've been what you're doing and where you're going and then look the actors in the eye and really listen. That's so cool. Jeez. So it was great. And just, yeah. just, Oh, I don't know. Last year I had the opportunity to run into to Bill Shatner at a convention. Oh, really? And, yeah. And he's in his nineties. Yeah. You know? And, and he remembered, 
he remembered it was wonderful, wonderful to kind of, you know, listen, it's a long time and he has lots of people that he's worked with. And he remembered, but, he remembered uh, being there with you for, well, for, for the part. A little, a little seven-year-old in a friggin' sparkly silver outfit. Who would forget? Who would forget me? <laughs> How cool was that that you saw him all these years later? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. And it was, you know, we did, and it was only one day of work. That wow. Star Trek, that Star Trek show. I mean, look at the legacy. Oh, it's and a huge. Had, well, you played a Ferengi too, right? Am I right on that? I was in, yes, I played a Ferengi in Enterprise. I played a human in Deep Space Nine. And as far as I'm concerned, I guess there was only a handful of human beings in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. Every, yeah. Every other character were alien of some sort. And I was in an episode of Discovery. The, a fellow, a fellow who has joined ranks with the Star Trek universe is Akiva Goldsman. And I've known Akiva a long time. And Akiva and I, um, shoot, we were at we were at my niece Bryce's wedding together. Wow. And we shared this absurd moment uh, at Bryce's what Bryce and Seth's wedding, and it just kind of bonded us. But you know, Akiva wrote a beautiful mind. He wrote Cinderella Man. He's oh, always God. been. He was a collaborator with Ron. And then he recently has become sort of a showrunner for the Star Trek universe. And, oh, wow. And and so, yeah, I'm still, I, I can't really say anything, but, you know, they keep making Star Trek television series. And I, I know I, they do. I apparently seem to keep getting hired. So that's what well, I can say about that. I Okay, then now that's fair. Hey, by the way, you mentioned, you did mention Bryce. In all the years that she, you know, was starting out and stuff and, you're obviously you're her uncle um and did she ever reach out to you in any way uh regarding acting like any tips any any thoughts no no wow. and no i didn't i i didn't you know dispense any say one is one one thing listen one thing is it's a practical thing you know ron r r basically raised his families back east um, and bryce, oh, i didn't realize that yeah bryce was a california baby Mm -hmm. But then she was, I don't know, four or five years old. She moved, they moved the family back east. So I didn't have, you know, uh, yeah. dad, dad in, imparted some advice to her. And, and, and Bryce had a, a tremendous relationship with her grandfather oh, and wow. dad, you know, dad would fly out to Connecticut and go to grandparents day. Yeah. You know, and that kind of stuff. So, and, you know, but not Uncle Clint. I mean, listen, the, the, the only the only show business story I have about Bryce is that she hired me and she she was directing a segment of a Lifetime Channel movie that she had an opportunity to direct. It was like a it was like a 30 minute. It was a third. It was a little bit like a Twilight Zone where they yeah, okay. had an anthology and she directed this one uh, story and it was called Call Me Crazy. And it took place in an insane asylum. Oh my God. And and I I played, Bryce called me because there was these group therapy sessions and there wasn't much of a role. I had one or two lines, but Bryce said, Uncle Clint, will you play one of these roles? And, and Cheryl, Cheryl, Bryce's mother, she's also in it, you know. In the same and, scene with you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, oh, let's see. God, I'm um, trying to think who the leads were. Octavia Spencer was, it was in the, in this Lifetime Channel movie. Holy cow. And, and some, um, I'm brain locking and I don't want to stumble, but there was another young actor who, who was in it. That's a, a, a name of note. Um, but wow. anyway, the, the story about Bryce is I'm, I'm watching her. Yeah. She, her movements on the set as a director. Yeah. Mirror what Ron does. Oh God, is that eerie? Sin sitting at sitting in video village, watching the monitor and then and then kind of scrambling up to the, the actors and whispering in their ear and giving them direction and talking to the cinematographer and talking to the crew. My God, it looked like I was I was looking at Ron. Oh, that's wild. And she did a great job. She Bryce really knows what she's doing and she's going to end up directing, you know, at, she's going to be good. She's probably already good. Yep. I, mean, I haven't seen a whole lot of what she's done. She's done a couple of documentaries and she's done some episodes of, I think she's done some episodes of Mandalorian. And, right. And, right. Um, I did see her name. Yeah. So, so, but anyway, the, what she did one thing, now remember she's the oldest of, she has 
three other siblings. Two of them are, are women, her younger uh -huh. sisters and her younger brother. But Bryce had this, Bryce had this habit. She'd go up and whisper in an actor's ear and she'd play with their hair. <laughs> And when after the first day when I when I worked was working with her and I called Ron I said Ron you got to be really proud you know your daughter is just outstanding I, I just got to let you know one thing there's she she acts just like you on the set <laughs> she does don't don't do this because if you do it people will think you're creepy <laughs> Ron got it right away being the oldest daughter she was fixing everybody's hair oh. she, she was the family hairdresser for her three siblings, you see. Oh, funny. So her instinct is to, she'd get in close and whisper a little, a little bit of direction. You want to twirl it on a curl like that, you know. Uh, <laughs> Jason, Jay, I'm thinking in the name, the young actor, Jason Ritter, John Ritter. Oh, son. of course. Jason Ritter was in this, ep call me crazy. What an amazing cast in that small little 30 minute deal. Yeah, yeah, it was fun. So anyway, yeah, that was wow. my, Bryce is doing great. And also too, um, you know, Bryce has a sister named Paige and Paige is living in New York pursuing acting and she works from time to time. She does a lot of voiceover work. Wow. She's also, Paige also just wrote a children's book that I believe it's going to get released sometime late this spring, which is coming up maybe April or May. Oh my gosh. Paige Howard. And okay. She's really talented and, and it, you know, listen, the, the Ron and Cheryl are really good, sweet people and um, one thing about Bryce, and I think all the kids, they have a perfect combination of their mother and their father. Because mm -hmm. Cheryl has a tenacity about her that is very unique. And then Ron is very, oh, I don't know, what, what is he? You know, he's very thoughtful mm -hmm. and he's systematic about getting to where he needs to go. He's not he's not rash when he thinks he's not rash when he behaves right uh, he's very measured uh and and still here's a man that he just turned 69 years old wow. and you know still directing movies hard yeah yeah and he's still one of the first guys to show up on a movie set every day well listen thank you i mean really thank you so much for being on it's just been such a pleasure thank you and it's been a really wonderful interview john thank you oh i well Without a doubt, without a doubt. And uh, I hope the rest of your day goes great as well, Clint. Okay. And listen, maybe we'll do this again. So when Ice Cream Man comes out, maybe you can talk to me as the director. I would love that, actually. Okay. Don't forget, if you want to see bonus footage of this interview, as well as get my newsletter, go to patreon.com slash that's classic. That's patreon.com slash that's classic. Enjoy.